Hello. Within the framework of the, of the International Microscopy Lectures by four international microscopy societies, I would like to welcome you to another interview with a pioneering microscopist. We are here at the Technische Universität Berlin in Germany in front of a, transmission, of a transmission electron microscope which is specially designed for electron horography. My name is Michael Lehmann and I am professor here at the TU Berlin. Speaking about electron horography, one famous name immediately that comes into mind. Professor Hannes Lichte uh, from the Technische Universität Dresden. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to have him uh, and a conversation with my teacher and mentor today. So welcome, Hannes. Nice to see you here. Hello. Welcome. <coughs> so please have a seat. Well, Hannes, I guess, I guess uh, we know each other for more than 30 years already. In fact, my first encounter with holography and hence with you was within a physics, physics advanced practical course about Fourier optics oh. on an optical bench. Oh, right? yeah. And, uh, well, which was given by you personally. Uh, you gave the, this course <laughs> personally. Right. Since then, we yes. often discuss one or the other scientific uh, uh, and non scientific topic. But today, there's a big chance to bring everything together in a wider context. So, before we actually start, uh, I would like to introduce him very briefly. Hannes was born uh, in Braunschweig about seven months before the end of World War II. He went to schools in Hannover and Karlsruhe, and after graduating, he joined the German army uh, for two years. He started studying physics in Kiel in 1966, but after a year, uh, he moved to Tübingen, which, which was very lucky because he met Professor Gottfried Mönnstedt. Further stations of his scientific career are, in 1972, the physics diploma uh, with a thesis entitled A Mike's Interferometer for Electrons. In 1977, a PhD thesis on a reflection mirror microscope for electron waves. And in 1987, the habilitation thesis on the image plane of excess electron holography of atomic structures. In 1989, he became C3 professor at the University of Tübingen, and in 1994, C4 professor at Technische Universität Dresden. For his scientific work, he has received numerous prizes, namely the Kairos Medallion, the Kerber Prize, and the Ernst Rüster Prize, in order to mention only a few of them. Okay, Hannes. Where shall we start today? Uh, well, I think in particular the young audience uh, in, is interested in how you as a student at school came to the decision that you study physics. Yeah, uh, as you uh, heard from Michael Lehmann, I had a lot of luck in my life. And uh, a very lucky situation was in my school. I was in a classical <laughs> gymnasium we learned Latin, ancient Greek, and languages, English, French. And uh, we had a lot of literature, a little bit philosophy, religion, and so on and so on. And so natural sciences were really not the focus of the school. But we had a wonderful teacher in mathematics, physics, and chemistry. And he was so obsessed with natural sciences. Uh, and uh, he followed the uh, rule, teaching is not filling a, a bucket, teaching is igniting fire. And so he succeeded uh, that four of 17 people at the end studied physics or chemistry. So I, after two years at the army, the army yeah. mm. uh, well, I had nearly no mental activity there, as you can imagine, a little bit, of course. But uh, I started physics in, at the university in Kiel. And there was a professor in the very first lecture on experimental physics. I will never forget this. And he started his lecture saying, only 35% of you, the audience, will achieve a diploma degree. That's hard, yeah. Indeed. What a provocation <laughs> of young students. I must say he was right at the end, but this was a moment for me to decide to fight. And so I fought two years after, uh, two semester after uh, uh, what I left Kiel and went to Tübingen, and this was a very happy uh, situation. 
First I had to pass my examination, the pre-diploma examination. And uh, okay, everything went okay. It was not very brilliant, but it was okay. <laughs> and then uh, we, uh, we attended the practical exercises in the Institute of Applied Physics of Professor Mönstedt. And I was fascinated, fascinated seeing all these different experiments. And uh, this was a TEM. This was an SEM. This was materials analysis by X-rays. And it was electron interference. And so uh, I decided this is the institute where I would like to uh, get a topic for my diploma mm -hmm. thesis. And uh, this was, in my opinion, this was fascinating physics. So I went to the office hour of Professor Mönchstedt and asked him for a topic of a diploma thesis. Well, he interviewed me about my background, about my studies, about everything, about my interests. And then he proposed, I have a topic which is highly interesting, and uh, this is electron interference topic. And uh, I would be very uh, much interested if an electron wave preserves coherence when it is reflected in an electrostatic electron mirror. Of course, this is a real challenge to... This was a real that, challenge. Yeah. This was experimental quantum mechanics. <laughs> this was very mystical to me, but at the end it was very challenging. And so I agreed. During this time, the institute was pretty large, wasn't it? At the Mönchert Institute. Uh, they had a lot of uh, uh, students, about 20 diploma students, 20 doctorate students. They had 20 engineers, uh, uh, precision fine mechanics, electronics people, and they had about 10 people, uh, faculty members, we would say, mm. professors and assistant professors and uh, people of the staff, of the scientific staff. So this was a very big institute, but it was a very familiar institute. Mm -hmm. This was very interesting to discuss with the neighboring students in a neighboring lab, in a neighboring room, uh, because uh, there were so many topics on electron optics, on iron optics, building instrumentation, developing methods, and doing all these applications for a very specific topic, like in my case. My topic was an electrostatic electron mirror, and uh, you cannot buy such an mm. equipment. We have to design it ourselves with the help of engineers. Then it has to be built. Then you have to do the test experiments, and finally, after, two years, in the case of a diploma thesis, you have a result, if you are happy. So, have you been starting from scratch, from scratch or had been there some standardized system for building such an electron optical bench or something like that? Uh, the institute was uh, an institute developing instrumentation, first mm -hmm. of all. And they had a, a standardized system they had electron lenses, deflectors, uh, sigmators, uh, deflection coils, I guess, all these things. Huh? Everything yeah. that you need. And mm -hmm. you just could pile them up one on top of the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was automatically uh, vacuum tight, uh, uh, if you did it correctly. And so you could end up with a two meter high electron optical bench con uh, uh, containing all the components you needed to reach your goal. Only the very specific component, in my case the electron mirror and the deflecting magnet, they had to be designed newly and built in the, in the workshop. Mm -hmm. And we had a fantastic workshop 
and uh, fantastic people there. And this was uh, really enjoyable. I see. Okay. And so you had no commercial equipment then in the, in the, in the institute? Or uh, hardly, hardly nothing. Hardly nothing. Okay. Uh, uh, the reason was, of course, that the topics of uh, Mönchstedt were pretty far away from mainstream electron optics. And uh, uh, so I remember we had an, an SEM uh, for uh, general purposes, we had an old TEM for practical exercises, and uh, uh, we had a, uh, a device for X-ray materials analysis and a photo emission microscope. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, th these were old machines, and they were only used as uh, uh, instrumentation for doing uh, special experiments. Okay. So uh, you had to build up everything by yourself. So you built up your experimental setup. And well, uh, I, I also know from my experience, uh, it's always uh, well, uh, a real fun or real pleasure then when you see the first electron beam down the column. Oh yeah. And I guess you had the same experience in <coughs> particular when, when you built up such, such instrument by yourself. Yeah? I, I know only about instrument, uh, installation of instrumentation but you built it up from scratch. So I, th I guess this must be a special feeling to yeah. see the electron beam. And uh, uh, the first electron beam, I will never forget this, and to try to handle it, to navigate it by means of the deflectors and to shape it by means of the lenses and to, to observe what happens. And this was uh, really uh, a wonderful experience. And, uh, uh, but then I had to introduce in the straight column the deflecting magnet and uh, 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 electrostatic mirror, and then I had to l search again, where is my beam? And uh, so I had to uh, fiddle around a little bit with all the parameters, mm. and uh, at the end I got the beam. Mm. And uh, this was one of the happiest moments for me as a diploma student, because this was uh, the way to go. Mm. And uh, uh, then came the next uh, challenge, this was the electron biprism. Because uh, I had to check whether I could produce interference with electrons that have been reflected at a mirror. So the question is, is, preser this was is a coherence question preserved? Of yeah. coherence. Yeah. And uh, uh, unfortunately in this institute uh, there were so many disturbances AC stray fields and all the pumps were running and uh, the traffic on the on the road close by and so on and uh, I only once uh, saw just by accident these uh, uh, fringes uh, and uh, uh, we had to go a different way. The different way was that Mönchstedt after uh, uh, seeing what was my problem, he decided that this experiment has to be moved into a, a special lab that has been newly uh, built in, uh, outside the uh, city, on a green meadow, no disturbances, and so on and so on. And uh, this was specially built for highly sensitive experiments. Mm -hmm for all the electron biprism experiments and at the end it was a special lab for electron interferometry and holography. So some, something like a, um, a green, uh, something like a, a, a drawboard then for the Dreamberg lab. Oh later, yes, of course, of then, course. Yeah. It was much yeah. smaller. Yeah. It was only 30 square meters or mm. so, uh, uh, but we had enough room for three people. Mm -hmm. Before we come to this experiment, uh, let's jump back a little bit uh, to Mönchert. I think Mönchert had a very special role uh, as a physicist uh, yes. and well, also his, his way how to, how to think about physics. <coughs> yeah, he, uh, uh, Mönchert was a very intuitive person. He had an idea and then uh, he went to literature and then he asked for the lens, his colleague in theory. And so he struggled for every idea. And uh, sometimes when you discuss with him, 
His answer was simply, this is the way nature works. Okay. He had no argument, he had no explanation, but he was convinced. This is the way nature works. And, and was and he right? Surprisingly, mostly okay. he was right. <laughs> right? Uh, for example, the, the conservation of coherence. Uh, he was convinced that uh, co uh, uh, coherence was conserved. But I discussed with others in the institute, and they said, no, this can never work. You just try it, and then you tell him it cannot work. And, uh, but this was very dangerous, because he would ask you, where do you know it from? And uh, uh, if you uh, couldn't give an experimental proof, this was not very good for you. Mm. <laughs> okay. And, but Professor Lenz has a, had a special role at this institute. Uh, yeah. Uh, because he was a theoretician by heart, I guess. He was theoretician. Yeah. He was uh, extremely well uh, uh, skilled in all techniques in uh, theory. That was uh, very essential for us. For example, calculating fields, ray tracing, and uh, Fourier optics, and uh, uh, imaging theory, everything that you uh, needed to understand. He knew it. And uh, he was uh, uh, in scattering theory. This was his uh, mm -hmm. domain. Uh, he was one of the best worldwide. So whenever you did an experiment, uh, then Mönchert was very strict. You have been forced to go with your equations, to go with your uh, numerical uh, calculations to Professor Lenz I know for it, yeah. approval. <laughs> and uh, uh, Professor Lenz, he was really a hard guy. He examined everything what you had been written what you had calculated and uh, but he was very fair and he always wanted to help you mm -hmm. to bring the experiments uh, to uh, really the highlight uh, uh, of your work. That's the same experience what I made as a, as a tiny uh, diploma student coming then into the office of Professor Lenz and discussing my, my, my things about uh, electron uh, holography reconstruction problem and the principle yeah. of that. Yeah. So th there had been um, um, a special, I think, atmosphere also with uh, the teaching then in this institute. So another um, and here is uh, Professor Kasper, I, I, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In this institute there had been a, a special, let's say, culture of teaching. Then. Yeah, and Kasper, uh, 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 he uh, offered a row of, or a series of lectures about electron optics, about everything, and he, he, he gave a, a script to the students which was handwritten, where all the relevant formula had been worked out and the relation uh, between them had been shown and applications had been shown. So we had a wonderful education in this institute on one side, the experimental uh, uh, education, on the other side, theoretical education. Mm. And we always had to see these two aspects together. So this was a good combination then. I, and as, as far as I've learned, uh, the, the book of Principle of Optics and by Hawks and Casper was yeah. one of the results of that. This, uh, yeah. I think of three uh, volumes in this one. Yeah, uh, this is a, a wonderful book and uh, yeah. this should not be missing in any library yeah. of electron optics. You'll find nearly everything in there. Yeah. Um, there had been also a point about uh, Mönchert. Mönchert was, was on every conference, or many conferences, I would say, and it contacts all over the world. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, so he met different people and I think also discussing uh, uh, lots of things. How does it, in, how has it influenced then your mirror interference microscope, microscope? And I think there had been some encounter with Dennis Darbour at the uh, stage. Certainly, uh, uh, we had an encounter with Dennis Garber. 
But this was not the only thing. Uh, you mentioned his uh, uh, visit, uh, his, his traveling activities yeah. around the world. He was uh, very familiar with Japan. He was uh, sometimes in US and uh, in Europe everywhere at uh, all the conferences and he had corporations. And so we had a lot of guests also in our institute. Mm. As a young student, it was fascinating uh, to, to see and to discuss with these people. I remember the discussion with uh, Dennis Gaboa. Mm. He came in 1969 or 70. He was guest in our institute yeah. and he visited us. And it was fascinating to, to uh, uh, hear his contributions, his ideas. Uh, yeah. For example, to my experiment uh, I was doing on the Michelson interferometer. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so we had a lot of people from abroad. Uh, we did our exercises in English. Uh, this was uh, quite nice. And uh, so we had people from Japan, of course, and we had people from US, we had people from, Ar from uh, uh, Australia and uh, Britain and uh, all the famous names, mm. uh, which I cannot enumerate here. Yeah, um, but I think one would say today this is some kind of an international competence center then for electron optics yes. in these days. Huh? Yes, huh? this would be yeah. the name uh, given today. Yeah, to him today. <laughs> okay, let's come to the uh, laboratory for electron interferometry where you build up your electron mirror interference microscope. Yeah. I think uh, there Dr. Herbert Wahl had a special role there in, in the construction of this uh, building and yeah. then later in the co collaboration with you. Uh, Wahl was a very uh, interesting person. He had finished his PhD on electron interferometric measurement of the uh, flux quantization in hollow cylinders. Mm -hmm. This was an extremely demanding task and uh, 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 thereby he learned how to optimize a lab. Mm -hmm. And Mönchstedt organized the money and the means to build up this lab uh, because Wahl wanted and uh, uh, should go in the direction of electron holography. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was uh, uh, the main uh, task Wahl uh, did after his PhD. He set up a concept for electron holography. And this concept was image plane of axis holography. So he's the inventor of this image plane. Yes, uh -huh. uh, because uh, the, uh, the basic idea of Gabor, just to take a Fresnel uh, uh, defocused image of uh, uh, or shadow of your specimen, uh, this would not be sufficient for atomic resolution because the coherence of electrons mm -hmm. would not allow it. The reason is that from a specimen like this one here, the scattered wave, they go into a, a certain angle of it, and the atomic fine structure goes into the large angles. So you have to catch the large angles by superposition of a broad, coherent reference wave. And therefore you need a lens. I and guess. therefore you need lenses, this is one point, mm -hmm. but you need a very bright electron beam, mm -hmm. you need brightness. And uh, otherwise you wouldn't end up in a quantum noise. Yep. And uh, so while asked the question, under which circumstances will I get the atomic uh, diffraction in a hologram without being limited by the degree of coherence? And this is the case if you go into an image plane because then the objective lens focuses back everything into the image mm -hmm. plane and you just need to illuminate coherently the image plane and the reference wave for the image plane. And of course you have to open the aperture. 
you have to open the, the aperture, aperture yeah, to uh, have all the reflections then. This is yeah. right. And uh, uh, the point is that even if you have aberrations now, and you need lenses uh, to form such an image hologram, and these lenses might have aberrations, even if you have these aberrations, then uh, they form a point spread function well within the image plane. So uh, that means that you can sample all the information in the point spread function coherently. So, and this is a point we will discuss, we will discuss uh, later, later on. Then, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, then you need some aberration correct, uh, correction, which can be done uh, on an optical bench, but uh, you have atomic information available. This was a point yeah. why while uh, developed image plane electron of axis holography. So as far as I know, uh, you had to, uh, in this uh, laboratory for electron interferometry two rooms. In one room, uh, uh, Dr. Wahl was, was uh, well establishing this image plane of axis electron yes. holography. Yes. And in, uh, in the other room, you had your electron mirror interference microscope. That's right. And uh, well, uh, how, how, does, uh, how was it working in the microscope? I think you have a, a slide with you. Uh, yeah. Where you can show uh, how, how this microscope is looking like, and there we also see this optical bench, electron optical bench. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, uh, on this slide, this is already the result of my uh, subsequent PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, when I moved all the interferometer stuff to this special lab, uh, I really could show that electron coherence is preserved. And I found out that uh, the height structure, the topology of the uh, mirror uh, surface would produce phase shifting effects. Mm -hmm. And this was the reason why Mönch did, offered me a PhD thesis uh, uh, to refine all these effects and to, to use such an interferometer or interference microscope for measuring surface structures. Mm. I, I think you have, you have a few slides with you uh, yeah. that can show uh, how, how, how something okay. like this is looking. This shows here, this is a result of my PhD work. Uh, this shows uh, the large high column, 2.4 meters. We have a field emission gun. This was a commercial one, which uh, we bought from Albert Crew in Chicago. This field emission gun by prism, and here is the heart of this uh, mirror microscope, a deflecting magnet and uh, the electron uh, mirror, then another by prism, protector lenses, camera, and so on. So, and here you see we uh, took such a triangular deflecting magnet, this is Henri Castin magnet, and then electrostatic mirror here, uh, you see here the drawing. Uh, we will not go into detail. The electrons are reflected. Go back. Here the biprism uh, allowed to navigate uh, partial waves and to superimpose them, as you can imagine here. And this was one of the results. This is a flat uh, glass surface, evaporated gold. And the squares you see here have a height of 2.5 nanometers, period 12. And you see in the interferogram very clearly here the deflection. So we can measure on the surface very small details. Or here there is a cleavage face on a uh, uh, calcium bromide uh, crystal surface. And here we have a plane reference wave, and this wave goes down. And so we get a phase shift here of approximately 10 pi. That means a tenth of this, or even a hundredth of this, can be measured on surface structures. And uh, uh, the same uh, with potentials on the surface. OK, so, so these were very interesting results, but what but? <laughs> what but? I finished this work in 1979, and in 1980, Binnig and Rohr 
-hmm. they came up with the scanning tunneling microscope. Mm -hmm. And this was much, much better. <laughs> it was much, much easier to handle. And it would cost only a fraction of such an electron microton interferometer. So there was no chance for further application. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had uh, to learn that the better is the enemy of the good. <laughs> But, but, this is my but now in, in this case, uh, well, you have learned a lot of wave optics, I guess, because you did it from scratch. Uh, you had a field emission gun, you had uh, uh, the, um, the reflection at the mirror, you were about uh, making interference pattern by means of your two bioprisms. So I think uh, this was a hard school, but a good school for the, ne for the next project. It was an excellent school. Uh, uh, First, uh, experimental aspect. What I have to do to see electron interference. And the other side, of course, is theoretical. How to interpret things. What means electron coherence? What does it yeah, really yeah. mean? What is a, way a wave propagates in space? And uh, Fresnel diffraction, Fraunhofer diffraction, uh, Kirchhoff uh, diffraction integral. And all these things, I must say, I learned a lot from Herbert Wahl. Mm -hmm. Because on a daily basis, we met, he did his holography, I did my interferometry, uh, and we discussed uh, everything that we saw on the screen, that we uh, evaluated at the end, and uh, when we asked, what is the meaning of such a thing? Yeah. And so we had... Uh, uh, excellent discussions and he taught me so much. I'm really grateful to him. And uh, uh, this was uh, uh, the reason that at the end there was no application for my PhD, but I had collected so much experience. I had uh, uh, learned so much about electron waves that I could go on and all the things around that vacu vacuum and, and electronics and all the yes, services and so on and so on. Yeah. All the things what we in our, our gen generation will never learn it in, in this detail uh, when we buy an instrument. And, you know. Instrumentation is so essential. Mm -hmm. Even if you use an uh, industrial uh, device, it is really helpful to understand what are yeah. the in instrumental details. This is the reason why uh, that I uh, tell my students don't use this instrument like a black box. We like to understand what happens in the microscope. That's very good. Mm. Back to the roots. Always. Back to the roots, of course, yeah. Always. And well, I think you have also a, a few interesting uh, first results from Wale, from his first holograms with you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here in, uh, in your slides. Okay. Um, um, I have to switch now here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Wahl recorded his holograms on an Elmiscope 1. This was built in 1952. It uh, still had radio valves in the electronics. So it was a really old-fashioned thing, but he mastered everything, he stabilized everything, such that he could, at the end, take holograms, image plane off-axis holograms. Off-axis means using a biprism, and uh, image plane means he recorded in the image plane. And uh, this is uh, original uh, pictures of all, and you see here, these are the objects, the uh, zinc oxide, something needles, and you see here the fringes. These fringes are the interference fringes of, in the hologram. And you see the quality is very, very poor. And this was at the beginning, field, uh, Wahl had no field emission gun. He had nothing uh, of these things that are standard here. You have a 300 kV field yep. emission gun or shock geometer is this. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so he had exposure times of up to 100 seconds. Unbelievable, yeah. 
And uh, uh, nevertheless, of, uh, he took approximately 100 holograms. But it was on a photographic plate during this it time. It was on phot uh, photographic plates. And uh, uh, three or four of these holograms, these uh, were good enough that he could reconstruct the waves. And uh, this we can see in the next slide. Or original from the uh, Habil thesis of uh, Wahl. This is a hologram. Here you see a bright field reconstruction. Here you see the dark field reconstruction. And here you see an interferogram showing the phase distribution in this object. And the point is, these reconstructions were made on an optical bench that he built specially for the reconstruction purposes of this of axis holograms. And he designed the mathematics behind it. And it's exactly what we are using today. Mm -hmm. But using this on a computer. We are yeah. using yeah. this now for numerical image processing in a computer. And this is exactly what ha uh, uh, Herbert Wahl wrote in his thesis. Mm -hmm. With all the sidebands and uh, masking out and, and uh, going back to real space and applying uh, 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 optical means to see the phases, to see the amplitudes. This has been there in 1972. Mm -hmm. He had developed this and applied it. And uh, this was fantastic. I guess we're really making then the foundation then for further work, for further exploration yes. of this yes. area then. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, during this time also mentioned that well, uh, had lots of contacts, people all over the, uh, the people all over the globe, to Dr. Watanabe, for example, at Hitachi Company in Tokyo. Yeah. And there is, was also a co young co-worker, Akira Tonomura, yes. in 1968. And, yeah. uh, and there were not so many experiments in electron holography after Gabor proposed this in 1948. I think the first were uh, Tom Mulvey yeah, and Mulvey. Uh, Mr. Hain. Yeah, Mulvey and Hain, yeah. And uh, in 1952, they made the uh, Frendel inline holography. This is the original Gabor proposal. Uh, uh, and then, in 1968, some, some years later, there came up two publications. And one was, I mention him first, Tonomura, mm -hmm. Akira Tonomura, on Fraunhofer uh, holography. What was the idea? Fraunhofer means you are in the far field of your object, very far away, and uh, you get a, a Fraunhofer diffraction pattern. You have to superimpose the undiffracted waves, so this is an inline experiment, and then you get uh, some interference phenomena there. And uh, uh, since uh, at reconstruction, not only uh, the wave is reconstructed, but also the conjugate wave is reconstructed. Mm -hmm. This is a so-called twin, twin image twin problem. Image problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, this was reduced in Fraunhofer because the distance of the conjugate images is yeah. very large. So it was a large defocus, I guess. It was a, an yeah. uh, the, the conjugate image appeared under an extremely large deep focus, mm -hmm. it was more or less a, a, a structured background. Yeah. So this was the basic idea of Tonomura. And uh, uh, the other uh, publication that appeared was uh, Frenel of Axis Electron Holography in the same year by Mölnstedt and Wahl. Mm -hmm. And there uh, they tried to make a Frenel that means a slight defocus of axis, that means using a biprism and uh, superimposing at some angle the reference wave, uh, uh, the hologram, and uh, the off axis technique uh, uh, solves the twin image problem. Uh, uh, that means 
that we have no more the superposition of the uh, conjugate and the uh, uh, non-conjugate image. But you have it out of the optical axis then, uh, the twin image. Yes, and the point is that in this case of axis, uh, uh, the twin images, of course, they appear always. But uh, in off-axis technique, they are separated angularly. Mm. So you just take a mask and mask this off, it out and, yeah. and yep. then you can use the yep. remainder and you can reconstruct the mm. wave. So these were the two uh, publications in electron holography. So, and Akira Tonomura was then invited to come to the lab. And uh, Tonomura, uh, he was with uh, uh, Watanabe mm -hmm. in Hitachi Company in Tokyo, and uh, Mönchstedt arranged Uh, that Tonomura uh, should come as a guest scientist to our lab and uh, to cooperate mm -hmm. with us. Okay. I think you have a, we have a, you have a picture of, of both of them. Oh yeah, this is oh uh, this uh, shows uh, it's a very interesting point. Okay. Uh, this is a focal series that Val reconstructed from one hologram on the optical bench, and you see here in the details of the fringes, it's under focus, it's in focus, it's over focus from one hologram on an optical bench. This is slightly the direction of aberration correction uh, that he uh, showed in this case uh, uh, already in 1973. So, this is Tanamura. Uh, happy youngster from Tokyo, very sympathetic, and we had a lot of enjoyable moments. And uh, uh, this shows uh, on the right side Akira Tonomura. This is uh, Ushikawa from Nagoya. He was in a, our group in the same year, and uh, uh, Bernhard Lauer and myself. Okay, this was a very happy and Uh, creative atmosphere, we discussed about many basics and uh, Tonomura was introduced by Wahl into the uh, image plane of axis technique that he had developed so far. So Tonomura was sitting at the old Elmiscope one and uh, uh, re recording holograms and uh, the yield was not extremely high, as I mentioned. And at the end, Tonomura learned how to reconstruct the waves so, so he on the optical he, bench. Yeah, so, so he was seeing all the difficulties you were fighting with, or um, uh, while was fighting with recording holograms. Then. Yes, yeah. of course. And so, okay, this is a step later. This, later. <laughs> uh, this was interesting. Uh, uh, when Tonomura left, he uh, stayed one year, and then he left and went back to Hitachi in Kokobundi. And uh, there he had the chance to develop a completely new electron microscope, specialized, dedicated to electron holography. So it had a field emission gun. Mm. He could produce wonderful fringes, uh, full of contrast and so on. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, designed very many beautiful experiments, uh, in particular in the realm of uh, magnetic structures, out to superconductivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, okay, we have not the time now to discuss details, but in my forthcoming lecture, I will show uh, the most beautiful examples. Oh, wonderful. <coughs> okay, um, well, let's come to atomic resolution electronography because at the end of your doctorate uh, procedure, uh, we, we were, well, you had your mirror microscope, but uh, you found out, okay, this can be somehow the end now of further development. And how did you came then to the, to the, to the topic that you well, further like to develop? Yeah. The atomic resolution electronography. Uh, the point was in 1979 when I finished my PhD and uh, uh, was disappointed by Winnig and Rohr, so <laughs> to speak. <Yeah. laughs> uh, and uh, I was thinking about 
uh, my future and uh, I saw uh, that uh, I was the only person in those days in this uh, uh, lab for electron interferometry. So, so, so Wahl had already left then? Uh, Wahl had left, mm, he okay. had a professor position in a, a different high school and was very busy there and then uh, Mönch said one day came and asked me, what are your plans for your future? Are you going to industry? You want to earn big money also? Or uh, would you like to uh, stay in academia? And I uh, really must say I've, I, I'm more in favor for research and mm. academia and I so understand. on. <laughs> and uh, he uh, uh, asked me whether I would have an idea what to do in future, what could be my working direction. And it came to me that uh, we, this lab has been the, the origin of uh, uh, image plane holography. And uh, now nobody is going on with this. And I uh, proposed electron holography would be a fine thing in particular if developed into the atomic dimensions. And Mönchel was very favor for that, I guess. Uh, he was uh, <laughs> enthusiastic and he, uh, we, we were sitting together discussing what would he need for the beginning. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he would take care about everything uh, that I would need. It was not so much at the very beginning. I needed a new Elmiscope uh, 1A, which was built in 1954, and uh, I needed for, uh, uh, in particular a field emission gun. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Professor Speidel in our institute, he had already developed a field emission gun, mm -hmm. and so uh, we only needed the material costs to build it in our workshop. And uh, we did this, and uh, so this Elmiscope 1A was a fantastic electron holographic machine. But you were limited then to the acceleration voltage. I think the uh, uh, acceleration uh, voltage that yeah. uh, during that time was this about 50 kV. Only. This was only 50 kV mm -hmm. uh, because of high voltage problems uh, uh, concerning the uh, isolator mm -hmm. uh, in the gun. Okay. Uh, I tried to improve it to 100 kV, but it turned out it is not necessary. Surprisingly, the optical uh, quality of this Elmer Scope 1A, equipped with a field emission gun, was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I could see carbon black fringes, which is 3.4 angstrom, mm -hmm. in this microscope at full contrast. Uh, uh, at uh, 40 kV, the point resolution of this microscope officially was 6 angstrom. Okay, I'm right. really in, this, in, in today days. Yeah. So <laughs> this means with a field emission gun on top, the information limit was uh, uh, much improved. And we mm. could see the yep. uh, fringes, which is not point resolution, which is only information limit, but nevertheless, Wonderful quality. But you need very fine fringes uh, for atomic resolution. Yeah. So this is a, a sampling uh, theorem, a uh, criterion which has been, I think, established by, by Herbert Wahl. Yeah, uh, and uh, so I, uh, this is the next slide here. This shows uh, what is the problem to, uh, uh, for atomic resolution holography. Uh, for atomic resolution, you need very fine fringes. This is one of the results of Herbert Wahl, that uh, 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 you need three fringes uh, to sample uh, uh, in a hologram, for example, a fringe distance in a crystal. And uh, 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 so this means if you want to reach one angstrom as a vision, you need 0.3 angstrom fringe spacing. And this was uh, out of reach. Nevertheless, what was uh, the problem? In the usual uh, uh, geometric arrangement, you have here the source. This is a coherence angle for a certain degree of coherence, right? Okay, here's your object reference wave by prism here. 
is superimposed in the image plane under a certain angle. This angle is given by the geometry here. Now, this angle is very small. This it means large, the yeah. fringes are very large. Now I thought, how can I improve this? And, well, it was not too complicated. Well, at, at I the put the, end, the, you know it, instead yeah. of here, I shift the vibration here. And then, for the same uh, coherent situation, I now have a much larger angle of mm. superposition. And this is what I did in my Elmis Cope 1A, and this was working fantastically. I got fringes much smaller, approximately two angstrom mm. fringes. This was sufficient for the beginning, yeah. and so I could go on. But you had the luck that uh, Professor Hermann came as a successor of Professor Mönchstedt, and he brought yeah. an, uh, an uh, Philips EM420, the field emission gun, one yes. of the this rare one. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Hermann came from the Fritz Haber Institute in Berlin and he was an expert in magnetic lenses and in imaging and in aberrations and in uh, doing everything in a microscope uh, at high resolution. So when he came to our institute he had nothing, an anoscope or something. Yep. Uh, and so uh, 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 in his list of course at highest uh, priority there were the wishes to uh, build up uh, a high performing electron microscopy. And uh, so he asked me uh, what would you need for holography? I, Hermann, I would like to have this and this and this and uh, you, you, are, you have some special needs. And I said, yes, I have one special wish, and this is a field emission gun. Mm -hmm. And then we could uh, improve things. And so he bought an EM420 with a field emission gun. The problem with this instrument was the following. Just uh, uh, to, uh, for, uh, to make the use of this microscope very easy by standard people they had by a small computer interlocked all the lenses. Mm -hmm. So you had a switch uh, uh, where you could select magnification, you had a switch where you could switch from imaging to diffraction and so on and so on, different modes of your electron microscope, but we had no free lens control. So at the beginning we could not realize this part of rays, but uh, with the help of Philips company, uh, uh, we succeeded in getting free lens control and then everything was uh, uh, improving. Because it was important that you shift then the image plane then yes. uh, for, yes. for recording holograms. Yes, yeah. we have to be able to shift uh, uh, the objective lens excitation a little bit so instead of here, we are looking into this plane, we have to overexcite the uh, intermediate image lens, uh, the intermediate lens uh, to look into this uh, uh, plane and so on and so on. These were tiny differences, but uh, we needed them urgently. And uh, okay, it was successful. We got fringe spacing smaller than one axon, 0.8, and then it approached 0.5 and uh, I remember taking my first atomic resolution hologram. This was uh, New Year's Eve 1984. So Everything was prepared. Uh, outside of normal working hours I guess. <laughs> uh, New Year's Eve yeah. means on the 31st of December uh, uh, let's say midnight. This is uh, New Year's Eve, yeah. when the new year comes in. And I was very alone in the whole building, right? Mm -hmm. Only the night guard was showing yeah, up sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I had uh, uh, aligned everything and so on and so on. And uh, 
shortly before the new year came in and all these fireworks would start and make a lot of noise. I made a lot of shots, exposures, 25, a whole box. And uh, so then the new year came, the fireworks started, it was very noisy, but I had some results in the box. Now I took them, went to the dark room, I developed them, fixation, everything, and then I had my first holograms. So in the same night you were in the dark room? In the same yeah. night, of course. <laughs> okay. I was very, uh, uh, I was, was not so patient to, to wait another day for the results. And so uh, I went into the dark room and I had my first real good quality holograms. 0.8 angstrom print spacing of carbon black with 3.4 mm -hmm. angstrom. That is constant. Mm -hmm. This was a remarkable day for me. <laughs> I guess so. And during these days, the reconstruction were, were all done in on, the, uh, on an optical bench. But yes. I, I think you found out that, that this is somehow of a bottleneck or of the reconstruction. Uh, you are, we had to go no, to, to numerics. On one side, uh, an optical bench is a wonderful instrument to, for teaching and every physics student uh, should uh, uh, be some hours, uh, work for some hours at an optical bench. Mm -hmm. Because there you can really see a Fourier transform. Yeah. So a lens as a Fourier transformator. Uh, yeah. A lens as a Fourier transformator. And you can mask out single reflections. And uh, you can happen, uh, look what happens. You can apply certain phase technique, uh, phase contrast technique, and so on. So this is what I recommend to every student. Go into the, such a lab and take your time. But the optical reconstruction for holography is not flexible enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 you need for reconstruction a special lens. And if you want to correct aberrations, for example, then you need an, a lens which is specially designed for your electron microscope, to the spherical yep. aberration and of your electron microscope, to, to counterbalance it. And, and uh, according to the experiments yes. you have done. Yeah. And that's why yeah. Uh, Professor Hamann, who was experienced in numerical image processing, mm -hmm. he recommended do it numerically. Okay. Uh, and I attended a course in Martin Tried in the group of Hoppe uh, on numerical image processing. And this was fantastic. And after a week, I learned so much. And they offered me to bring a uh, photographic plate for scanning. And so uh, we scanned a, a hologram. We reconstructed it in Martin Street in the computer with the help of uh, Rainer Hegel, what's his name, mm -hmm. a fantastic guy. And uh, so this was the first uh, numerical reconstruction, at least in our group. Yeah. And uh, the consequence was that we had the chance to buy a workstation. You remember the, the computers uh, had a frequency, a clock of six megahertz. Yeah, megahertz, not, not gigahertz. Yeah. Mega, <laughs> megahertz. megahertz. And so uh, we were so happy, we were able to buy a workstation for 40,000 D mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, this had a clock rate of 40 unbelievable 40 megahertz it was our star in the in the, in the institute and it was called gabor it was called gabor, gabor. Yeah. yes <laughs> this is worth mentioning and uh, uh, in in uh, since then uh, we were reconstructing and uh, uh, first steps of aberration correction. This was your mm -hmm. uh, work, your diploma thesis, and your doctorate and thesis doctor at thesis the end. Yeah. Uh, they had been performed at these instruments. It was unbelievable. We, uh, I remember I uh, needed for a focal series uh, from a hologram, I needed approximately uh, one hour per focal step. 
And this was only 256. Calculation pixel time. Well. This yeah. was a 256 by 256 pixel uh, 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 reconstructed wave. Yeah. Right? But there had been later then interesting results in uh, doing aberration corrections. I think the problem is that there are about 10 parameters, which has oh, to even be more. Even more. <laughs> even more. Yeah. Even more, which has to be determined. Yeah, we underestimated yeah. this problem completely, yeah. I must say. Uh, uh, we thought, okay, uh, we have to focus. This is one parameter. Spherical aberration, this is another one. But then we have two for twofold astigmatism. We have two for threefold astigmatism. We have two for actual coma. And we need to gauge the wavelength. We need to gauge full space and all these things. This was uh, a nightmare uh, that we uh, 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 tried to uh, find other solutions. And uh, uh, I remember this was one of your points in your PhD work. Uh, for example, is the idea uh, we can use the symmetry relations of the phases in Fourier space, which was not uh, available before the dark times of holography. But now we can reconstruct the phases in Fourier space and we can examine their symmetry. And uh, uh, we know, for example, that the uh, uh, phases in the uh, refractions are symmetric in case of a central symmetric so crystal. Central crystal yeah. Yeah. So, and if we know additionally that this is a pure phase object, then we can say, okay, the phases must be pi over 2. So we just exchange the phases to pi over 2. And in case of a, a central symmetric weak phase object, mm. we can do this. And then we have corrected aberrations. We don't need the 10 parameters. Yeah. But in a more general case, when you have thicker samples and so on, you need another criterion. And this was one of the things what, what I tried out. Well, this is what you should yeah. mention now, because <laughs> yeah. this is your PhD yeah, work. Yeah, this is part of my PhD work, where yeah. we tried to, uh, uh, well, to, to use the amorphous edge then of a crystal uh, to minimize the contrast in the amplitude. Yeah. I think in, in your slides, I think you, there are a couple yeah, of, of examples. Uh -huh. Oh, first of all, we, we come later to the Treenberg lab. Yeah. Um, well, we, um, we have here a hole here in a, in a, a gold foil. And uh, the, yeah. the, the thing is how we can determine the aberrations. And by minimizing the contrast here, uh, we can finally out where are really the atoms here in this case. And um, I think this is uh, fascinating. Yeah. If, you, if you go back, I get you, back we okay. have here the point spread yeah. function convoluted around the hole, blurring everything. We don't see really where is the hole. And now we correct for aberrations. Correct and the point the spread function shrinks to a delta. And we see the face here. And, and the face is then peaked then at the atom positions. Yeah. And, and then we draw a line stand here, for example. Yeah. Then uh, we can uh, extract here uh, the phases. And yeah. from the phases, we can even measure how many gold atoms are there yeah. in, this, uh, uh, in this column then. Yeah. And this has been also then exploited then here for uh, gallium arsenide here. And there was asking in that material science question, where are the gallium atoms and where are the arsenic atoms? And doing holography from the amplitude, well, this can hardly be judged because it's okay. so complicated. There's hardly yeah. a difference between yeah, the two. Yeah, this is uh, very noisy and also influenced there by uh, intrigant aberrations. But when you correct uh, for uh, aberrations and, we, and you take care that the radio on zone axis, really we can identify, okay, this is a gallium and this is arsenic, this is a gallium, this is arsenic column. Here also already, already from the line stand here. Yeah, uh, we should say that this is a beautiful example for holographic materials analysis uh, possible on an atomic scale. This is because we have a certain relation between the phase shift of a single atom and the at atomic numbers. And there is a relation given by Earl Kirkland, I think, mm -hmm. and he showed that the phase is proportional to the atomic number and the exponent is 0.6. So this is a very clear relation and that's why we can uh, in many cases, 
uh, distinguish between different atomic species. Despite the fact that they are really close together in the in in uh, atomic number. Yeah, yeah they are no. 1.4 yeah. atom or so. Uh, yeah, and the distance and also the, uh, the atomic number. Yeah, so yeah. this is only so two. It's 31 and as uh, is 33. Yeah. yeah. I think we have here. Uh, but well, we can later show this, I think. Yeah. Um, because there's again a, a, a aberration correction. But let's yes. come to the Trimberg lab. I think this has a special role then. Yeah. Uh, uh, you move okay. to, to Dresden. If you, if you go back yeah. to the slide, it shows why this Trimberg lab was so successful. One more, One and more. just a, a building. Ah, oh, the building here. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's far away from any civilization. This was uh, uh, the prerequisite. Uh, but of course we need electricity and we need water and we need something else. So this was a building uh, constructed in a way that it was very uh, uh, insensitive against mechanical vibrations, that it did not produce by itself uh, disturbing AC stray fields. So uh, uh, we had in this lab a situation which is approximately 500 times better with respect to the stray fields than a normal good lab. Okay, and uh, this was outside Dresden. Uh, distance to the next settlement was two, two or three kilometers. So it was extremely quiet and I remember when we moved our CM30 yes, from, Tübingen. from Tübingen to this place. This was done by Philips company and the service engineer, Mr. Ludwig, he did the job and he uh, uh, installed the microscope and uh, all of a sudden he came out of the lab screaming, what the hell is going on here? And uh, I asked him, what, what's the problem? He said, without the air cushions of the column, I have atomic resolution. I see the gold atoms without anything. Which, which, was, which has never seen before yes, in other labs. Yes, no, no. this was uh, really fantastic. And uh, so these uh, examples uh, with uh, the gold crystal and the gallium arsenide and uh, 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 the uh, final uh, example that we would like to show, uh, again the gold crystal, uh, 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 no, uh, these two have been uh, the, the, the taken be in Trivenberg and this and, one, and this one here has been taken at FEI yeah. cooperation between Berlin, Dresden, and FEI. Exactly, because okay. we had here a, a gold foil here in the microscope just for testing the, the microscope, and uh, this was an aberration corrected microscope. And so we are now entering the uh, the age of aberration correction. And uh, despite the fact that we uh, use the aberration correction, our atoms here, in particular in the face, are they are tri triangular shaped and not round, what we expect. So this indicates the aberration corrector was not uh, perfect. Not perfect, but very good. And this helps us a lot uh, to find then the aberration coefficients. But gold atoms usually are not uh, have not a triangular shape. No, not triangular shape. And therefore, <laughs> when I switch <laughs> to the next uh, transparency, so then you see the things what you also expected from then for from uh, simulations, uh, that you had uh, really a peaked uh, value there of a high contrast uh, at the faces uh, where the uh, gold atoms are, and you see something like a donut structure uh, in the amplitude image. Yes, and you see how complicated then this uh, re uh, residual wave aberration is. So this is a good combination between um, aberration correction and electron holography because this is a, these are the data for yeah. fine tuning. Uh, this is remarkable. Yeah. For example, the focus four nanometers, uh, spherical aberration of third order, 0 0.01 millimeter. This is fine tuning. This is one of the wonderful possibilities uh, holography offers that uh, uh, even in, a, in an aberration corrected microscope, we have the chance for a posteriori aberration fine tuning. So but there is also an advantage of aberration correction for holography. 
these machines are much more stable mm -hmm. because aberration correction needed. We have a more stable uh, illumination part, the condenser optic is better. That means the degree of coherence is better for a given uh, brightness of the gun. And uh, uh, there are so many advantages of both sides that I would say, okay, aberration corrected microscope is uh, the best basis for doing atomic resolution horography. So in the, in the very end then, um, uh, Dennis Darbo's dream of uh, well, correcting aberrations in a second step has come then true. If you go one uh, step further, yes. Yes, <laughs> because then you can really measure how many uh, um, uh, atoms then in a column. This is one gold atom here. You see one gold atom here. Two, three, four, five. And look at the amplitudes. Oops. The signal is already for one atom. The signal is in saturation. So you cannot discriminate between one, two, three, four, five. The amplitude looks always the same. And what's even more interesting, that the phase images of atoms are very small. And uh, that you see uh, in the interspace between the atoms. Yeah, here yeah. in interspace. We have nearly no atomic information. But in the amplitude, we have the full modulation still. So uh, the spreading of the atomic information, which is not due to aberrations, this is the interaction. The interaction between electrons and the object, the gold atom. That's what uh, produces this wonderful effect. And uh, I think uh, this is a beautiful example. I'm very happy about yes. this. Right? But atomic resolution is not everything with doing, for doing holography. There are other very, very interesting examples where you use the uh, reconstruction of the electron wave, the phases of the electron wave, then uh -huh. for measure electric potentials or for measuring uh, magnetics. And I think we have one, oh, we can skip this uh, for a moment. We, uh, we have one example here uh, of a 3D potential what you have brought with you. And maybe you can explain something about that. So I oh yeah, this is an example uh, 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 produced by Daniel Wolf, who is an expert now, I would say, on uh, holographic tomography. And, uh, but uh, I must admit, uh, the first experiment on holographic tomography uh, was performed by Tonomura's group, 1991 or so. And then there were uh, uh, experiments by Alison Harrison Twitchett mm -hmm. and uh, Rafael Dunin-Borkowski mm -hmm. in Britain. Cambridge in, in Cambridge. those days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they had to uh, do the whole tomography series by hand. And Daniel Wolf has now everything under computer control. And this is a very nice example. So can we start this uh, I have to click the next one. No? No? So. Oh. And this is uh, just a, a nanowire. And now we are looking outside, inside. We see that there is a gallium arsenide uh, uh, core in the shell. And we can analyze all the structures. Uh, so we have now 3D. Holography in light optics is 3D. But it can't be in electron optics because scattering is always in a very narrow forward direction. And this means we cannot move out to see the object from a different perspective. We have to stay within this cone. Uh, so uh, the trick is that artificially we open up the scattering cone by rotating the specimen and take many, many, many holograms. And then we have uh, uh, covered the whole angular area that we need for a 3D. And this is what you see here. And then you do a back propagation and uh, yeah. put it back then to a 3D model. Then. There's a lot of mathematics behind yeah. it. There's a radon transform. Uh, 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 
and uh, I, can, I will not go and cannot go into details. But you have a second example with you. Yes, uh, we have an, uh, another one, and this is unveiling the three-dimensional magnetic texture of skirmion tubes. And this is from Daniel Wolf and Axel Loeb, and uh, this shows uh, uh, what we can see today. Uh, these are the skirmion tubes. In this direction, we see here our specimen, and uh, now you can uh, cut through the 3D and uh, you can uh, look at the skirmions, the distribution of magnetization around the skirmions, how they interact and so on. It's fantastic. Okay. But there's another uh, degree of freedom that had to be opened. And this is a merit of this group here, which hosts us today. And therefore, again, I give you okay. this you machine. Sure. This is a time resolution. We need for many uh, things, we need a time resolution to understand processes. And this is uh, now my interview with Michael Lehmann. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so please explain us yeah. what you are doing. Well, we, sp we have spoken the whole time about that we need an environment which is extremely stable in order to retort, record our interference fringes. Because when we have an environment which is, well, well, which is uh, disturbing, uh, so for example, we have it's loud or you have AC stray fields or something like that, your microscope is shaking, for example, then you lose the, the interference fringe and therefore also the sideband information. And of course, uh, this is the thing what we normally not like to, 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 to try, but you can do it on purpose. And that's an interesting topic on that. So we had a, a very crazy idea, I would say. Let's shake the microscope at a certain time. So you, you open up your, your camera, you have the uh, exposure time, double L T, and uh, normally um, uh, you shake your column and you don't see interference fringes and therefore you know sideband. And only for a small time for our gate, we, we leave the microscope undisturbed. And leaving the microscope undisturbed means you get the sideband information. Then you go on and uh, you, you, you shake the microscope again and, and uh, you lose the information in the sidebands. When you sum up everything on the detector, then you have the interference fringes only valid for the small uh, gate time uh, tau. And doing a reconstruction for time-resolved holography, we cut out the sideband and this reconstruction process. This acts really like a temporal filter. So you don't need a special uh, electronics uh, for filtering out. And uh, Teuger Wagner and my group, he took over this, this, uh, this difficulty to establish that in the, in the microscope. So he took the microscope, like the one uh, we are having here today in the background. This one? This one, yeah. And uh, using a function gen generator. With this function generator, he produces a gate signal, uh, which is uh, normally disturbing the microscope. And only a small gate time, uh, everything is quiet. And this is fed uh, to the condenser by person. A second signal, a so-called control signal, is then to a biasing holder where he has the structure and modulating the structure, the, uh, modeling the, the, uh, uh, the electronic structure then of the, of the sample. And then we have the gate, and this gate then uh, is shifted. So by shifting the gate, we can then sample uh, the control signal. So this is, for example, the control signal as measured here on the oscilloscope, uh, which we apply then to, the, to, uh, to our sample. And uh, for 3 megahertz, so that means a, a, a periodicity of 333 uh, nanoseconds. And so we are using, for example, a PN junction, and this is contacted here, the PN junction. And uh, we normalize the potential, uh, so we uh, take um, a, a hologram without um, applying the voltage and then we measure only the differences then due, the, uh, due to the uh, external applied voltage. Then. And so we have the gate signal, it's a, a, a distance of 25 nanoseconds and uh, so this is then shifted step by step and 
always holograms are recorded and uh, the normalized potentials reconstructed. Since this is here on a high level, so it's zero volt, there's no phase information. And when we go to the reverse biasing voltage, we see a phase uh, distribution then over our PN junction. And when we do, do this now uh, step by step, we get it in a time resolved manner. That means uh, you see how the, now the switch terms, the, the uh, PN junction takes some time uh, to, uh, to apply this voltage and then we switch back uh, to the original value then. So we have both, we have, nano, we have uh, uh, nanometer resolution as well as nanosecond uh, resolution. We have both doma domains, uh, the uh, spatial domain as well as the temporal domain. By the strange idea uh, of uh, shaking the microscope. Okay. So, what do you think, what is next uh, with the microscope? Wh what has to be improved uh, for better recording of holograms uh, in the future? I don't know what next will be, but I'm sure that uh, we have to take care about one parameter uh, which uh, enters all uh, uh, the relations here, and this is the brightness of the gun. Uh, we can improve the brightness of the gun, and we should do it uh, uh, by some highly sophisticated, more sophisticated field emission uh, or something else, I, I do not know yet. But uh, there is some uh, s uh, space left. Uh, you know that the uh, uh, occupancy of uh, states of electrons in the phase space is very loose. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, is, is uh, still some possibility to have a, a denser uh, uh, electron uh, uh, distribution there and uh, uh, I think we urgently would need a higher brightness by let's say a factor of 100 or 1000 and uh, this would help with time resolution this of would course, it help would now. help with atomic resolution, it would help with potential resolution even if you are in the medium resolution uh, uh, domain. Uh, this would be fantastic because you have short exposure times, you have uh, a more defined uh, state of your specimen and so on and so on. So there's a lot to do and I'm rather op optimistic. Uh, another point, uh, I don't want to go into details now. It's uh, 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 a very burning question that's burning still here and here. Uh, uh, this is the inelastic coherence. What happens with uh, the coherence of electron waves if, uh, if they suffer an inelastic, inelastic interaction? Yeah. So this is a point. Uh, let's talk about this in some years. Then we see more clearly. Or, or in, in your, uh, in your uh, lecture you're going to give then after, Maybe. This, after this Yeah, uh, that's a good idea. Yeah? That's a good idea. Okay, let's come to, I think, a very important point. And uh, I, I, I also my feel, uh, myself feel it that is a really important point, and that's creativity. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, <coughs> you, you, have, you have made so many uh, thoughts about how is science working. And I think everything, uh, always or the al almost all times, it, it boils down uh, to, a, to the word creativity, which makes science then. Yeah. So Be because yeah. uh, if you go one step further, yeah. this is a beautiful image by Pablo Picasso, very famous. Only a couple of lines expressing everything. And so this is a typical example for creativity. But people forget that creativity is one of the most essential ingredients in science. And I will give uh, two examples. Denis Gabor. I heard a so-called hearsay. A hearsay. I heard it and I say it. A rumor. He was an adolescent, was very active in, in a sports club. 
And after activities, they took a shower. Boys and girls separated by a milk glass. And he started pondering. The information is there. A similar problem came up with the Shatter theorem 1936. Lens er uh, aberrations are unavoidable. And again, the question, what do we see? The information is there. It is blurred somehow. Is imaging without lenses possible? So curiosity raises question, consciously or unconsciously. The brain is searching for a solution. And uh, later Gabor reported on an Easter Saturday in 1947 on the tennis court between two matches relaxing in a deck chair. So his brain was not occupied with science or so. It came to me without any effort on my side. I did nothing. It was just a divine intuition, so to speak. It was a sudden insight that interference and diffraction are the two sides of the same coin. And this gave birth to holography. Example merged it. He had the idea with a filament spanned across the back focal plane in a lens, in an electron lens. He can block the zero beam and produce a dark field image. Why would he do it? There you can see uh, phase uh, structures without Czernik. Well, he did the experiments, and at first uh, uh, glimpse he was uh, disappointed because he found not one dark field image, he found two of them. They were partially superimposing. I would have been disappointed and would have tried over and over again. No. His explanation was that filament charge under the beam produced two superimposed images. And now, his serendipity, his creativity, takes over. Overlapping images. Oh, is coherence given? Oh, can we find interference? So instead of producing a dark field image, at the end, he produced interference microscopy and he interfered uh, finally electron holography. And he, and he wrote everything down there on his, on his uh, lab book. Yes, and, and, yes, and, and, there's and, a famous and, uh, lab book. I was asking them these yes. questions. Then, yes. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and there are some people, I met them, they, they are excellent physicists, they can do everything. They master skillfully difficult standard situations, but Whenever they are confronted with a new idea, they shrink back. They don't like this situation. These people feel snuggy in their closed world. And uh, novel ideas make them feel uncomfortable. But science cannot develop. It will be stationary. So we have to look for uh, creativity in the uh, sense of Gabor, in the sense of Möllenstedt, and uh, everybody of us needs uh, creativity. Walter Kossel said a physicist is an innovator. That means a scientist is creative by definition, otherwise he cannot produce science. And, uh, okay, yeah, what I, do we need? I, I know the picture you're, you're always drawing then when you have young students in, in your group and, and you say, okay, you like, a student should develop his own flower, uh, his own uh, uh, say name there in the world. So, so, so you have to, uh, to unleash the creativity. 
Yes. You have to unleash. That's the right name for yeah. this. Uh, uh, you have to guide. As, uh, when when you are a professor, you know this. You have to guide people to reach their goal. But uh, you have to guide them in a very loose manner, so that they can develop mm. their own creativity. That they can think about their own solution, not only ask the professor, what should I do next? Which screw should I tighten now? No, they should go their own way and find their own way. Of course, they need a wide spectrum for of solid knowledge, I guess, and, well, and still it's <laughs> indispensable. Yes. But of course, uh, you as professor, I guess, uh, you have to admit a uh, leisure. To, to oh, uh, that's uh, very... I'm trying to, to Gabo's idea like a tennis court. Uh. Yeah, this is very essential, that you have to uh, switch off your brain. You have to switch off your brain to, to find extraordinary uh, uh, solutions. And uh, uh, there's a problem, of course, that uh, uh, the organization of science now, I think it's, it's even worse today. This uh, uh, does not help developing science, uh, creativity. Administration tends to control everything and to plan everything. And uh, this is not what we need to develop creativity. And uh, politicians, I have uh, written down some points Uh, politicians don't understand the importance of leisure. They confuse it with idleness and doing nothing. It's very difficult to do really nothing. Yeah. Indeed, Because yeah. usually Indeed, yeah. the brain is yeah. always yeah. working. They confuse, the politicians confuse activity with creativity. Yeah. And uh, they confuse timesheets with productivity. This is what you can do in a factory, but not in a research lab, right? Because uh, people have to be creative to have find novel ideas over and over again. And uh, they confuse controllable working hours with unpredictable aha moments. Mm -hmm. The aha moment of Very Gabor, yeah, yeah. the aha moment of Möllenstedt, the aha moment of very many other people who have been so creative. Yeah. And uh, this should not be confused. Well, And what do we need then for better science? Well, I have uh, grown up scientifically in a very uh, good environment in this respect. Mm. Uh, uh, we had institute funding. That meant Mönchstedt got the money for running the microscope. And only in very special cases, when he needed a very uh, uh, costly equipment, uh, uh, then he uh, had to apply for the money mm -hmm. at DFG and so on and so on. And uh, so this means uh, there was a lot of flexibility of financiation of the institute. And there was enough trust into the professor that he will spend the money according to his profession to foster the work of young people, to improve education and so on and so on. And this trust Uh, should be recovered, right? Mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, uh, would be very uh, uh, essential. And, and what do you mean uh, by in, uh, with, the, with the statement, science is not a democratic enterprise? <coughs> yeah, there is a very famous discussion in climate research about this that uh, 95% of all climate scientists agree with uh, some uh, 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 that humans are responsible and so on and so on. 
This is, of course, nonsense, because uh, science is not a democratic enterprise. That means we cannot vote for the truth. No, we, are, we have measurements, we have we, we measure. Of course. Things. You know, uh, uh, there's a famous story about Albert Einstein. When he developed his uh, theory of uh, relativity, a journalist asked him, Mr. Einstein, uh, what do you say? Uh, there are 100 physicists uh, uh, who are opposing, uh, opposing uh, your theory of relativity. And Einstein said, why do you need 100? One is sufficient. <laughs> yeah. So this means if there is anybody who really is in a controversial discussion, successful, mm. then this is sufficient in science. We don't need a majority. We don't uh, need a minority. We need uh, the search mm. for truth. And this needs controversial discussions. And I think also an, uh, a very famous example for that is uh, Louis de Broglie, where it was the discussion about particle and oh wave. Oh, yeah. This is even more interesting. Yeah. yeah. This well, is even more interesting because it shows the problems. Uh, a very creative person like uh, Louis de Broglie has with new ideas. And uh, uh, there is a story I was told by people who uh, are in the uh, De Broglie Fond Fondation Louis de Broglie in Paris. And you can read it. He submitted his PhD thesis to the university in Paris. And uh, uh, people, his professors, were not so enthusiastic about it. And they say, this is not uh, uh, science, this is speculation. And uh, OK. And uh, they asked Albert Einstein, who was in those days the president of the German Physics Society in Berlin. And he was asked for a referee report. And Albert Einstein was enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. And so. Louis de Broglie got his PhD in 1923 or 4. And five years later, the Nobel five Prize. Five years yeah. later, <laughs> he earned the Nobel Prize. Yeah. This is fantastic, yeah, isn't indeed. it? Indeed. Yeah, indeed. This is fantastic. Yes. And this shows we don't need consent. We need a dissent, because dissent is the lifeblood that push, uh, pushes science ahead. Mm -hmm. and so, okay. so, the, so, so the lively uh, discussions then in the lab uh, for really boiling down uh, a very fundamental setting of the physics, for example. Yeah. yeah. So what's then your advice for, uh, for young scientists oh. uh, and in connection then to well, VC creativity? Mm -hmm. And I think you have also the next slide. There's another slide. There's another slide. About creativity. And this is this one. Uh, you know this wonderful concerto, clarinet concerto. This is such a simple melody. And uh, this uh, is, of course, uh, composed by a very creative person. And this is, again, the same situation. These are not only simple tones. This is the context of these sim simple tones, which makes a, a fantastic a melody. And so every young scientist, I would recommend, develop your creativity and uh, avoid situations uh, that your uh, creativity is blocked by yourself mm -hmm. or by others. And uh, you should, uh, like a butterfly, you should hover over a meadow and looking for all these nice uh, aspects and flowers and uh, plants and take the best out of them to configure your science. I think this is what we have to learn from the old masters 
In our case, we discussed Dennis Gabor, Gottfried Mölnstedt, Friedrich Lenz, and all these great people, they have done exactly this. And this is what I would recommend. Right? Right. So, I think this is a good uh, word for closing this conversation. And, uh, well, uh, many the stories to be told, uh, uh, in, uh, but this is outlook here for the next generation of students, for the students and scientists. Let us stop here. Many thanks uh, for the conversation about you, the development of electronography, and for sharing your thoughts about politics and creativity, most importantly. So thank you, thank you so much, Hannes. So thank you for joining uh, us, and thank you for also uh, all the audience there outside for joining us uh, in this conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's so let's have a coffee. <laughs> <laughs>